There we go. <laughs> and, uh, following the talk, there'll be an op opportunity to ask Professor Kumar some questions. If you could submit your questions throughout the talk using the chat function, I'll collate the submitted questions and put them to Professor Kumar on your behalf following her presentation. So I'm delighted to introduce you to our speaker. Professor Sunadini Kumar is an associate professor at the School of Global Affairs, AUD. Previously, she taught political science at Lady Sriram College in Delhi University. And Professor, Kumar, Professor Kumar's research interests center around urban and regional politics, gender and political theory, and the global South. So that's over to you, Professor Kumar. Thank you so much. Can you hear me well? Thank you, Jess. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, we haven't, uh, you know, I haven't had the opportunity to speak to, you know, people from the Lucy community. Uh, when the invitation for the talk went out, uh, one of my classmates from my time there 20 years ago actually got in touch with me and reminded me that we were in classes together um, in social and political sciences. And uh, it's really, really uh, a lovely feeling to actually go back to some of those connections and networks. So thank you, um, Lucy, for organizing this. Um, as Jess just said, my research interests are actually around urban and regional planning. Um, and uh, you can see the title of my talk uh, on the screen here. It's a rather ambitious talk. And on that note, I'd probably like to make two qualifications, um, almost an apology. One is that it's incredibly late here. So, um, you know, I'm not my brightest, uh, but I'll do my best. And if I'm sort of partly incoherent, please point it out. Or if there's something that I said or assume that, you know, that uh, doesn't make sense, so let me know. Um, and the second, as I just said, is if you just look at the title, it's a, it's a sort of, um, you know, wide ranging, ambitious scope. Um, so it's all of the 20th century and it's reflections from all of the global south. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to be able to get um, all of that covered. Nobody can in 40 minutes or any length of time. But I do want to explain what I'd like to do in this talk before we actually get into it. Um, so it's not that the, you know, that the reason that I sort of did want to talk about all of the 20th century is because there are some, you know, really interesting uh, patterns and, and sort of um, currents that we can see when we look at the century as a whole. And, um, you know, it's the long durée perspective that actually brings up certain things that a closer look at say a decade or a year or a particular part of the world, uh, smaller than the entire region of the global South would not bring. And in fact, I am interested in, you know, as my, um, as my you know, uh, as my designation states, I'm, I teach at the School of Global Affairs. So I am interested in this, question of the global and what gets defined as the global. So this will be my entry point um, into actually um, sort of talking about cities um, and the kind of overlaps between cities that I find so fascinating that we see not just cities, but also urban planning that we see in the 20th century. So I'll explain a little bit more in detail um, as I start sharing the, the kind of uh, presentation I have. Uh, so this is the second qualification. One is just about the lateness of the hour. Uh, but the second is that, you know, this might be, uh, you know, a case of biting off more than you can chew, but we'll see how we go. So, yeah, I'm just going through some images, very, very well-known images. Um, and the question that I'd like you to keep in mind is, what exactly is a global city? Again, a very large question. It's not even one that I would normally consider, you know, worth our while asking, uh, because it tends to be one of these buzzwords or catch all phrases that probably obscure more than it reveals about the actual nature of urban development in the world today. And certainly this is a problem when, it's, when we start talking about the cities of the global South. Um, in fact, before we go further, I wanted to just say that, you know, people ask me what I do and I say that I study urban planning in India and um, the usual response is, so India's cities are planned. Um, and most of the time I get this response from my fellow Indians, uh, from my compatriots. Uh, 
Uh, and so the so this brings up actually quite an important question about what we think of um, as urban planning itself and what do we consider to be a city, leave alone a global city. So a term like global city might not even be very uh, explanatory or descriptive as far as the nature of you know, the places that we live and work in are concerned. And most of us are going to be living in cities of one sort or another by the end of the century, um, statistically speaking. So yeah, so I'm just putting this, we're just going through these images with this idea of the global city in the background. If you have any thoughts around it, it would be nice to hear, you know, in the discussion section. But uh, there's a reason that I'm going through some of these very widely circulated images um, and these iconic images, monumental images of what we think of normally when we think of the global city, right? And I sort of put in two uh, slides of New York because, well, it is the most iconic of the global cities. There's Paris here, which is an interesting exception because as you can see, you don't have the skyscrapers, right? This is one of the central districts of uh, Paris and they've taken great pains. Of course, you can see the clear effects of the grid-like grid -like structure, this how, what is called house minimization. Uh, and you can see in the background, you have a more classically 20th century city form, but what they've done in this historic um, central district is to preserve some of the 19th century buildings, also very well known. So, but it's still considered a global city. It's one of those uh, cities that whose names roll off the tongue when you ask somebody, what are the big sort of global capitals of the world? Paris will be on that list. There's Hong Kong. Um, again, simply because of the sort of the paucity of space, the effect of the sort of the crowding together of the skyscrapers is, is really dramatic. And that forms its very distinctive skyline um, with the bay at the back. So again, a very well-known, well-circulated, um, so iconic visual. So interestingly, if you do a Google search for global city, which I do every few weeks just to figure out where the discourse in the world is, um, of course, a lot of the images that come up are about, you know, are put up by people who are engaged in some kind of real estate uh, commercial activity of building cities. So this is a city called Bonifacio. Um, it's, from what I can tell, it's the, um, I don't know that much about it if there's somebody here from the Philippines. Uh, I think this is on the outskirts of Manila and it's very aggressively promoted um, on the web as you know, the dream city of the future. So we're now sort of moving away, of course, from the well-known global, urban, iconic, monumental cities that we have you know, seen so many images of that we're so familiar with that evoke a certain set of images, lifestyles, uh, urban form, what we call the built form, right? The way that the cities appear. Um, and there, there is the rather well-known set of associations with the cities that we've been seeing so far, but we're suddenly in new territory. And then I'd like us to move into even more unfamiliar territory as far as thinking of a global city is concerned, because of course, we ultimately, I ultimately do want to talk about the, the context that I um, am trying to understand, which is of the global south, and specifically of what do cities in the global south mean? What does it mean to have an urban space in the global south. So we're moving away, we're sort of moving um, east in a way, east and south. This is um, one of India's growth stories. Um, also a very well-known photograph of Bengaluru, which used to be called Bangalore. Uh, it's, it's got the stadium, it's got some of the familiarity of the urban form of the classical sort of city of the global north, which is the skyscrapers, but it also has this, you know, you can, you can kind of tell that it's not in the global north. There is a kind of uh, foliage here that is tropical somewhat. The 
uh, kind of concrete that is used. You know, there are little elements here and there, giveaway elements that tell you that this is not probably a city in the global north. Probably. So it's not entirely obvious, but yeah, you can pick up certain elements if you really start looking. This is Kinshasa. Um, and, you know, if it, this was a discussion, I'd probably ask you what your response to this was, but we can talk about that at the end. Um, it has several, again, of the elements of what we see in those early images, which has the skyscrapers. It does appear to have this kind of grid-like structure in the streets. Um, yeah, and, and, at, and at first glance, it could be anywhere in the world, right? It could be in any hemisphere, it could be in the north, it could be in the south, the east or the west. So this is probably the downtown district, um, the business district. And um, one interesting fact about um, urbanization in the coming century is that, you know, again, not surprising, most urbanization is expected to take place um, in Africa. Most of the most rapid urbanization is expected to take place in Africa. You know, think tanks around the world will pu publish policy papers speaking about the kind of, you know, the rapidness and the scale and the complexity um, of African urbanization, um, which also will bring me to a quote that I want you to all, you know, which, which will actually be the way that I actually start saying what I want to say. But you know, let's look at this other image of Kinshasa. So this looks very much like, um, in a way you can tell that it might be a city in Africa. There is something about the cars, there's something about the buildings, something about the layout of the streets. Um, it could be Latin America, it could be Cuba maybe. Um, but yeah, it doesn't, it has elements that are again, drawing attention in terms of how different they are from the typical landscape, the down, you know, the, 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 the images we have of the downtowns of global cities. And of course, again, like I said, do, does the term, does the phrase global city actually mean anything? Uh, should we just jettison it? Is, is, it? Does it make any sense to use such a large capacious term? Is it just a buzzword that is invented by, you know, uh, urban policy think tanks and governance think tanks and things like that? Um, that's a valid question, and we can keep that in the background. We're moving further into the disruption of that familiar skyline and the urban form that we've seen so far, right? So this is Cairo, and this is this just has, at first glance, without even looking twice, it has such distinctive elements. You know, and to me, one of the most distinctive elements is the dust and the smog, the, the kind of pollution that is endemic now in cities of the global south. Uh, the sheer scale of the cities that we have now in places like, I mean, China, of course, is famous for its um, smog, but India, Delhi is, you know, has been number one, has had the dubious distinction of being number one in air pollution for years now. Um, and so you, you, so just the, just the smogginess of the air and the dust and, you know, you see the, of course, you see this iconic sort of uh, mosque. And here we are in Delhi. Now, this is a rather, this is actually a, faithful representation of what most of the city looks like. You do have a couple of high rises in the back, but most of the city um, is a kind of mid high rise sprawl. You have the same dusty, smoggy sunrise or sunset, I'm not sure which one. Um, and you have this kind of um, chaos, you know, this, um, the use of non-conventional building materials. You have a completely broken, um, not broken, but yeah, kind of a disrupted skyline. Um, you have the mix of formal and informal and semi-formal 
housing and building material. Um, you have very, very dense and tight packing in terms of population and you know density of you know the concentration of population. Of course, it's not the same kind of densities that you will see with skyscrapers because it's more flat. But just see the sort of the numbers on the street. If you can see, just see how closely packed the houses are. There's barely any space between them. And so this is a, you know, a, a good faithful representation of what most of Delhi actually looks like, how most of Delhi lives. And this is far away from, again, some of the, you know, the monumental images of Delhi that the government likes to circulate and that most of us also like to see those of us who live here, because it's easy on the eyes to look at what is popularly called Lachin's Delhi. I'm just going to go back to this thing to uh, the slide to finish this point, which is that you know, so this is a is not the kind of image of Delhi that uh, you'll find on tourist brochures. This is not the kind of Delhi that you know finds its way into uh, many urban planning um, journals and articles. A lot of the urban planning of uh, you know the journals and articles, you know, from about 20, 30 years ago, we're still discussing the colonial city of New Delhi. Um, which is popularly called Lachins Delhi in here in, in, in India and uh, named after Edwin Lachins, um, the famous town planner. Um, but like I said, this is how most of the city does look actually. This is where most of the population of the city um, lives. So um, I, like I said, the question of urbanization in Africa, um, is something that causes both excitement, but also very distinct anxiety and trepidation in, so I've taken a kind of representative statement by um, somebody called Edward Glazer, who's written an article called An Exciting Urban Age. You will find hundreds of articles like this on African urbanization, um, if you look online. And uh, this is from, um, the website of a well-known urban policy think tank. Uh, and I can share the link later on if any of you is interested. Um, so you can just see the statement. Um, I won't read it out, but you can see what is being said here. Um, especially in the text that is in bold, right? The rise of mega cities like Kinshasa and Karachi certainly creates challenges. So what is happening in the 20th century and now of course in the 21st century is that, so my central argument will be that urban planning language and the conceptual frames that we have for urban planning have not in fact managed to even begin to capture what urbanization means in the bulk of the world today. And that's because of the domination of the classical city of the global north in the popular urban planning language and imagination. Uh, it's also because of this obsession with monumentalism and what cities used to look like um, in the 19th and the 20th centuries. So in a way, it's a question of not having caught up. But I think there's a deeper structural problem in the way that cities themselves are located within modernity, which is what I'm going to try and talk about. Um, I think we are at the halfway point in terms of time. Jess, could I just have a, an indication? Yeah, so I, yeah, I think we are about halfway. So in the remaining time that I have, I'm going to try and sort of basically set out the thesis that cities have a complicated, I mean, it looks like cities are, you know, um, the quintessentially uh, modern human settlement, right? There's a kind of old association between cities and modernity. But not only is this somewhat misleading to think about this as an, some kind of a natural association, um, and there are sort of subsets of this association. So there's also an assumption that modernity equals industrialization and most cities are born from some uh, consequence of industrialization, right? So a bulk of the urban planning literature uh, and a bulk of even the popular discussion on cities, you know, in websites and newspapers, 
um, in in the media, in in you know amongst people, and in common sense, uh, thinks of cities as somehow connected to industry, and industry as of course connected to modernity. Um, and so there is this assumption that we live in uh, a kind of human settlement that is almost dependent upon modernity and is it, it's the most quintessentially modern form of human settlement. Um, against this, I'd really like to argue that in fact, there is this really tortured relationship between cities and modernity. And once we start unpacking that tortured relationship, which exists as much in the global north, and in fact, more in the global north and more in the planning literature that comes out of the global north than it does in the global south because we live with a much more uncertain urban form a much less um, predictable uh, kind of urbanization than the one that we have witnessed in the past um, so that that we have less of this investment um, in the idea of you know urbanization as being a kind of modern way of life. So, I mean, the, the, there's, there's more confusion, but there's also more um, opportunity to rethink in the global South, which um, I hope I'll have the chance to say something on by the end of the talk. But certainly there is a, a great, I think, ideological investment in presenting some of these iconic cities of the global North as the norm, and as quintessentially urban form, uh, modern urban forms, modern human settlements, which the rest of the world hasn't caught up with. And if you look at development and modernity and progress in a kind of teleological way, then the assumption is that either cities like Kinshasa and Karachi catch up well, or they catch up badly, or they don't catch up at all, but the norm remains the same. The norm is those well-known images of global cities and whatever we think about the people who live in them, the kinds of lifestyles that they engender and so on and so forth. So we simply do not know what to do in a way with this, the scale of urbanization that is unfolding outside of the global north, outside of Europe, outside of America, in continents like Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Uh, and that's primarily not because, I mean, not only because we have you know, this kind of divide between the theory coming from the North and the reality unfolding outside of the global North. That's one uh, very, very important reason. And that cuts across, it's not just true of planning, but it's true of all literature on development. Um, so for instance, we'll have, you know, those of you who study development and capitalism will be hearing about things like you know, is there an Asian form of capitalism? Is there a Latin American form of enterprise? Is there an African form of, um, you know, uh, policy making or bureaucracy and so on and so forth. So there's all the, always these sort of preface, pref prefixes or prefaces added to, uh, you know, what we think is normative capitalism or normative urbanization or normative modernity. So there's a kind of struggle, there's a gap between where the theory is coming from even now, even now. And so I'm a scholar that lives in the global south and I work in the global south and I engage with other scholars like me. Um, so even now there is this kind of uh, struggle to make the theory match the reality. And that's one very important reason. But what I'm arguing here is that I think the problem is deeper than that. It's not just a question of the theorization and the theory that is coming out and the language that is coming out about, uh, uh, about cities. It's a uh, it's, a, it's an outcome of the, of the complicated relationship that cities have to modernity itself. So what do I mean by that? So as uh, the short description of the talk had said, this is what I'd like to talk about. So one of the things, one of the ways in which we can actually move away from this um, sort of inability to actually theorize urbanization in the global south is to start looking at lateral histories of urban planning in the 20th century, which is what the kind of research I do looks at. And what strikes one immediately is the incredible amount of overlap and circulation and cross-fertilization of ideas of urban planning between different parts of the world. That's one. The other is how a relatively small and relatively irrelevant group of planners who were 
uh, who were self-anointed in a way as experts, as regional planning experts. I'll come to regional planning in a bit. Um, how quite a small group of them actually traveled around the world, uh, influencing planning practices, urban planning practices in different parts of the world. Uh, and of course, having quite different outcomes in different areas because reality does not conform to the way in which planners think, unfortunately for them. Uh, most of them are aware of this, but that doesn't stop the enormous clout. And you know, so when I say that they were irrelevant, I feel that, I mean, I'm arguing that they were irrelevant in the long durée. Um, they were irrelevant in terms of the objectives that uh, planners set out on paper, but they had enormous clout in terms of the way in which they were received as experts in different parts of the world and especially outside of the West. So you will see amazing similarities in the way that planning concepts have been used in the West and the East or the Global North and the Global South. And you will see a rather small group of people and ideas hyper circulating and moving across the world and producing some rather interesting hybrids around the world. So Tehran, New York, New Delhi, Canberra. I've also talked about Baghdad a little later. Uh, I have a quote from a planner who looks at Baghdad, uh, Brasilia, you know, they all have a lot more in common than we normally realize. And the reason that we don't think of the commonalities is because of this steady repetition and domination of images of cities, um, iconic cities from the global north. But actually the bulk of the world lives in hybrid urban settlements. And when I say hybrid, there's two levels of hybridity. One is, as I said, there's a hybridity introduced between the aims and the ambitions of urban planners themselves and the actual reality on the ground, whether, uh, you know, whether in the North or the South. And there's a hybridity that is um, inevitable. Uh, if you start taking seriously, if we all start taking seriously, as I'm, as I'm making a case for, um, the kind of relationship between cities and modernity. It's not a straightforward relationship. In fact, if you start looking at the roots of urban planning, they lie not in the urban, but in the rural. And in primarily, I mean, to put it very simply and perhaps crudely, in a kind of yearning and a nostalgia for the loss of the rural. So what do I mean by that? So this is what I want to just talk about. And I think we have maybe 10 minutes. I'll just I have a lot of slides, but we don't have to go through all of them. Um, I'll just summarize that um, what I mean by what I just said about nostalgia for the rural. So this is a theorist that I liked. Um, I like, you know, it was who was very helpful for me to think about, um, you know, the kinds of points that I'm making, uh, the kinds of things that I'm interested in, and and so on. There's a um, Italian um, architectural historian called Manfredo Tafuri. And he makes this very interesting point, which you know I, I see proved again and again when we look at um, some of these iconic uh, city planners of the 20th century and also the city plans, that in fact, that city plans in modernity have a rather anti-perspectival character, okay? And they aim to produce sort of, you know, in the built urban form, um, a combination of order as well as tumult. And what they're quite, uh, so what Tafuri is arguing, and I don't have the time to go into, some of you might be familiar with his work. I don't have time to go into the details, but what he's arguing is that the, at first glance, if you just go back to the images of the skyscrapers or even of the less uh, um, classical images of the city, say of Ghana or Delhi, um, the first thing that one sees when one sees the kind of sprawl and the kind of spread of modern cities, um, as well as the densification and as well as the close packing of the buildings and so on, is this combination of order and tumult. Um, and so the contrast with the kind of urbanization that we see in medievalism, for instance, is that in medievalism, you had archetypal schemes of order, right? Whereas in the modern uh, urban sprawl, conurbation, megalopolises, whatever you want to call it in the modern city, in the iconic global cities, the first impression is that of looking at a forest or looking at a 
um, kind of a, a park which has elements of order but also elements of chaos. And Tafuri is making this argument that in fact, what we have tried to do when we have built our modern cities, our global cities, our modern cities, is to reconcile the principles of nature with the principles of human settlement and the built form. So nature versus artifice. Instead of accepting the total artifice of the city as a human creation, we have again and again and again tried to in insert the city back into the countryside. And of course, that's not possible. Of course, it's a complete impossibility in its very uh, ambition, in its very intention. But that is what has informed some of the most powerful, eloquent, and you know, visionary urban, plan and urban and regional planners of the 20th century. This continuous insertion of the countryside into the city, right, to bring the sort of the the uh, the harmony, the, the the you know the vitality, the kind of the quality of replenishment that you will find in the countryside into the city. Now, what that signifies, and Tafuri doesn't say this so much as uh, you know I conclude, uh, is this ongoing discomfort with accepting the nature, the true nature of the urban, which from time immemorial, from the time that it started, has been an intervention in the natural environment, a human artificial intervention in the natural environment. It is of course not natural, but there is an effort to produce the combination of order and tumult that is found in nature. This is what brings us to, this is what causes the birth of possibly the most influential, but irrelevant in terms of its original stated aims, planning philosophies of the 20th century, which is regionalism. And there are many figures associated with regionalism. Uh, the most famous is Patrick Geddes, who some of you might be familiar with. He was, um, you know, an iconic uh, sort of beloved uh, sociologist, teacher, civic surveyor, uh, from Scotland. He had a kind of transatlantic influence. He also traveled to India, which uh, Indian planners uh, know about and talk about, um, and was altogether a very important voice in planning at the turn of the 20th century. He also had um, a lot of, uh, you know, followers in the United States, where similar sorts of philosophies about going back to, you know, the kind of so that there was a nostalgia for the 19th century when regional planning takes off in the 20th century. Now the 19th century is seen as a time of, you know, uh, the sort of the rural idyll, you know, the rustic ethos, uh, small village communities, the primeval wilderness, and so on and so forth. So there's this effort by modern regional planning to preserve and integrate some of that lost rural ethos, and you know, the intimacy of small face-to-face -face communities. And whatever we think of as, you know, um, wilderness into the city. Now, of course, the actual processes of urban development do not really. So these are these are just thinkers and who've written about this. You know, there's some. You know, these are you can see for those of you who study literature, there is, you know, there's this connection between uh, the imagination of America in the 19th century in some of these well-known literary figures, uh, Emerson and Thoreau, uh, and this, this nostalgia for the, um, I mean, it can also be, it could also take conservative forms. I mean, there was a homesteading nostalgia that, you know, America experienced in the 19th century, but, you know, this whole idea of a small, uh, intimate, cozy community that would sort of really root America and prevent the ravages of modernity from affecting America. And so you have Regionalism as a philosophy being sort of propagated in uh, you know, America by students of Geddes like Lewis Mumford, again, a very familiar figure, uh, especially in the interwar period with a lot of government support. Uh, by the interwar period, you can imagine that America is firmly in the industrial age, even if it catches up a little late. Uh, it is in fact building this massive war machinery 
it's a it's a it's a humongous economy already uh, it's a massive nation state but its urban planners are firmly wedded to nostalgic understandings of protecting america from the ravages of capitalist modernity and so regionalism becomes the vehicle to actually put that into practice now this may seem like a small or peculiar set of people or developments but in fact these planners traveled around the world and what they did was to again and again bring in these um if i may be permitted woolly headed um notions about reconciling city and country into diverse historical cultural economic settings around the world and in that way they brought in the a kind of dangerous discomfort with actually existing urbanization and that of course then leads to some very very interesting consequences some good some bad um around the world but what it does you know what what does happen is this kind of export of this disavowal of uh capitalist urbanization modernity and urbanization and all of this kind of the the economies that are coming up these national scale economies that are coming up in this very influential set of thought leaders and policy makers and planners so the region comes up as a savior right it's a call for, call for the restoration of pre modern temporal rhythms um one of the most interesting parts of the story i'll just sort of quickly jump to delhi and try and wrap up here a really interesting part of the story is that there was an organization called the regional planning association of america again some of you might have heard of this it included apart from mumford who as i said inherits a kind of transatlantic tradition of regional planning from patrick geddes it also included these very well known um, architects and architects are of course different from city planners they're invested in individual buildings they're trained to create buildings that are livable that you know and they're also very focused on how a building looks uh, they're very much into the visual and the and the aesthetic elements they don't deal with the kind of scale that um, urban and certainly regional pl planners require to have like right? because they're dealing with just much larger uh, areas but interestingly many architects who were doing individual building projects became part of the regional planning association of america and they started putting in you know they started uh, advocating for the kinds of ideas that i've been talking about they actually failed to get any of their central plans passed in america the new york region um ends up being you know ends up looking very different from the way that they had envisaged it new york was supposed to be one of the crucibles one of the sites where regional planning ideas could succeed but of course there are you know very powerful forces that are actually building the new york region that are always out of the hands of the planners so you have suburbanization due to the spread of automobiles you have the real estate commercial interests you have labor and migration you have race and you know this uh, the, the way in which um, immigrant and racial minorities built the city so there are real concrete historical forces on the ground that are actually building new york and regionalizing it if we can use it as a verb but you have then this set of planners again and again trying to create uh, a reconciliation of city and countryside and they really fail clarence perry was one of them he was dealing with the uh neighborhood so these were some of the there's a very interesting term called sloips if if you want you can look this up um this is a term used by a canadian planner called edward relf um it's an acronym for spaces left over in planning so again and again what we saw what you see with cities but especially with regions is these empty spaces that get left over in planning and they start becoming either unpoliceable tracts right or they become pockets of dubious real estate value by the 1950s and 60s you know regional planning is all but dead in the global north because of reasons that i mean this is the uk story i won't have time to go into that but it's pretty obvious that you know the town and country planning act in, which was passed in july 1948 in the uk for instance 
is not going to take care of the kinds of contradictions that are already beginning to show themselves um, as far as planning is concerned. But there are some heroic efforts made. Uh, Plymouth is one of the early exception, uh, sort of, you know, Plymouth sort of uh, is, a, is a place that uh, is a city that very clearly rejects some of the principles of regional planning and shows the way in terms of how cities would start developing um, later on. Plus, as Peter Hall, one of the best known writers on regional planning says, by the 1960s and 70s, certainly, a radically different philosophy called containment has begun to talk about the dangers of conurbation, Greater London, for instance, and these endless conurbations that had begun to appear as a result of the, you know, the automobile revolution and suburbanization and some of the things that regional planners should have really expected, but they didn't. What ultimately happens is that under the context of the Cold War, all of these philosophies get exported across the world, get implanted in different soils. And this is a term that actually Corbusier, who's not a regional planner and who's, uh, who's it's very interesting that he uses this kind of terminology, but he talks about something called the soil of architecture. So planning ideas get implanted in very different soils. Um, this is Baghdad that I spoke about, Ghana, Egypt, each of these situations throws up some of the um, failures of regional planning. It does also, they do also, I mean, these, these uh, urban settlements become livable to a lesser or greater degree because of the combination of various other factors that will always be present in the growth and expansion of cities. So it's not as if they've failed completely in that sense. But in terms of the original intention of regional planning, which is to decongest the city, decentralize the city, find a counter magnet. This is the language that is used by the Delhi planners. Find a counter magnet to the magnetic historical attraction of the city, which it's never been clear to me why a counter magnet needs to be found um, because cities are going to be about densification and congestion and densities. Uh, in terms of its original promises and its original intentions, I don't see that regional planning succeeded anywhere in the world, but it is still part of the planning discourse. It is still, uh, uh, you know, it still finds its way into the latest Delhi master plan that has just been published, which plans for the next 20 years. Uh, those planning um, devices that these planners were talking about as far back as the late 1800s, the early 1920s and 30s, uh, they're still being sort of uh, accepted as articles of faith. And there is still a disavowal of the actual extent reality of urbanization and of cities as a human artifice on the environment, which actually explains the environmental disasters that cities are now deeply implicated in. It is the disavowal of the artifice, as Manfred Tafuri says, uh, and not uh, the fact that, uh, you know, it is, not, it is, it is a, it's the failure to actually embrace how artificial cities are and that how artificial they all, always must be because they are human creations that has actually created, to the, created this kind of continuously cascading, snowballing environmental crisis that we are in today because there is this effort. So in, in short, I'm... This is an Indian sociologist. Um, I'm going to try and wrap up because I really do want to see if there are any questions and I can always come back. Um, so just see what Radha Kamal Mukherjee, an Indian sociologist is saying under the influence of, uh, very clearly influenced by Geddes in 1932, this whole idea that the village and the region, re, uh, city could not be rigidly separated, either as analytical categories or as empirical domains. This is a very large claim to make that the village and the city cannot be rigidly separated. He's not saying this. He's not saying that actually existing villages and actually existing cities have begun to seep into each other, which is, of course, the reality around the world. We see it so much in India. He's saying that they cannot be separated even as analytical categories. And this, even though it may not seem it at first glance, is in fact a powerful call to allow the city to in a way incorporate and swallow up what used to be the rural. So um, 
I will not go into the details of what happened in Delhi. But if you look at the Delhi master plan, the Delhi plan is actually a plan for Delhi region. It's not a city plan. It's a regional plan. Why Delhi, which is a historical capital, which has been a capital of empires, you know, all the way till the British Empire, why it should be conceptualized and reframed as a region is never very clear. What are the advantages of looking at Delhi not as a city, but as a region? It's not clear, right? Because it's not as if, uh, it's not a mild form of regionalism that is found in some parts of the world. Um, it's, a, it's a very strong form of regionalism, at least if you look at the plans. Um, so yeah, so that's the end of my uh, slide. But what I, I just wanted to come back to Radha Kamal Mukherjee here. Um, what Mukherjee's statement actually reminds us, and if you just if we just go back to Tafuri right at the beginning, is that I, you know, if the ambition was for the countryside to be incorporated into the city, into the modern city, what might have ended up happening is that the city has spread and been incorporated and swallowed up the countryside everywhere in the world. Um, there are people who say that it is inevitable. There are people who say that it is good. There are people who say that it is bad. But what is clear to me, if we look at this long durée history of, regional, of, of urban planning and city planning, and if you look at what happened in the global north and the south, what is clear to me, uh, if you look at the 20th century as a whole, is that it is precisely the disavowal of the uh, artifice of human settlements, which is what cities are, and this nostalgia for the primeval wilderness that has ironically created a situation where we don't have a real um, rural left anymore. We think of all of the remaining rural and the wild as merely containers for further urban expansion. And then we, of course, lament the environmental disaster and the costs of it. And then we come up with all kinds of schemes. But this idea of the region as reconciling the two might have been one of the chief players in why we are here today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I can't see that we had any questions yet in the chat. Has anyone got anything pressing that they'd like to ask Professor Kumar? Um, know that we had a comment about it being questionable who defines planned or unplanned, disorganized, organized, formal or informal, etc., and that there's an underlying power relation. Um, and I think that made me what I this is obviously not my field, and it was really interesting to think about and how how that power relation might play a massive role in, like you said, this regional idea has been kind of a, a failure from what I can imagine, like what you've seen across the North, why would it be like, why would it be something that the South is taking on? Is that to do with that historical kind of, this is a city and we have to keep following it rather than changing the underlying ideas? Yeah. So um, shall I answer that or I'm just trying to yeah. see if I, I can mean, read the question. So this is a question by Hong Gao, or? Uh, it was more of a question? comment. A comment, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, there... I kind of joined them up into a question and a... <laughs> I'm not hearing you very well, Jess, so I'm just trying to figure a out. A question it. And, and a statement. So it was more, sorry. It says my internet connection is unstable, but it shouldn't be. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, much clearer. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Sorry, there's a bit of a delay. That's all right. So I think this question, this comment or, uh, you know, just a sort of an intervention by Hong Gao is, yeah, it's super important because, of course, this entire idea of planned and unplanned is a bit of a myth, you know, and when people ask me whether Indian cities are planned, they're, they're quite right in a way. Uh, because the forces that in fact, push urbanization and the, you know, make it take the shape that it is taking in, you know, different parts of the world, planners recognize that these are really powerful forces. It's usually 
you know, uh, something to do with real estate, it's to do with governments, they are to do with, you know, not all cities have any connection with um, industry. The cities could be planned as administrative capitals, they could be monumental, they could be historical, they could be, you know, all kinds of reasons why cities, you know, exist in the world. There, there are all kinds of forces that create cities. But what is common to all of these forces is that there is this element of coming together of magnetism, of densification, and all of the advantages of cities, all of the attractions of cities are really about those, uh, those, those features. People come to cities not only, I mean, I think that the economic argument is really important, of course, but I think it can also be made in a really reductionist way. People migrate to cities because there are job opportunities, of course, but it reads, raises two questions immediately. One is why are the better job opportunities located in cities, right? Why, why do we not have especially in the global south, uh, we have a deep state of rural crisis. So why do we not have uh, adequate employment opportunities or attractive employment opportunities coming up? And why do the professions that normally accompany rural areas look so unattractive to most young people? Um, so that's one. The second question is, you know, this, the second point I want to make is that, you know, people also migrate because cities represent a particular way of life. They represent, for instance, for Historically marginalized castes in India, they represent a form of upward mobility that is not available in the village. But that's just a really stark example. There are so many personal, uh, sometimes inchoate reasons that people would like, to, you know, they like to live in cities. There is, there is the, the well-known reasons that the European sociologists said at the beginning of the century, you know, the, the pleasure of walking on a street unrecognized, anonymity. There's that. There are there are so many different reasons. It's there are so many subjective, intimate forces that drive people to cities, and of course, economics and jobs are one of them. So coming back to this question about planned and unplanned and so on, um, the actual forces that organize and develop and expand cities are so complex. Planners are aware of it and are barely able to capture them on plans. So most cities are in fact unplanned. And of course, the question of power is central to this, because who is whether somebody is in power or not is not the only whether whether the city is planned or not is not as important. And I quite agree with you, Hongkao, that as uh, who is in power to take decisions about the city. Thank you. That's a really clear answer um, to a very convoluted question that I turned that really nice statement into. Sorry about that. Um, we have um, someone just raised their hands. Uh, I think it was, uh, do you want to unmute yourself? Or? Yeah, sure. Um, I just want to, uh, whether you can elaborate more about, um, uh, for example, you, you said um, that uh, architects uh, tend to focus on the apexes of, um, of urban, urban planning. And also I, I, I um, uh, from the past two years, I have also um, know that um, um, all urban planning, or all the plans have to be um, approved by the city council, and those councillors are usually um, elected, not professionals. So I uh, just want you uh, wondering, what's your take on who should be making those planning um, decisions? Yeah, thank you for that. This is a long debate, actually, in urban planning and outside, I mean, outside urban planning as well, in larger political circles and, um, and cities are, so cities have varying degrees of urban, or, or sorry, of political influence. Um, what is historically true is that municipalities have been powerful in Europe and not so powerful in America and certainly not powerful in the part of the world that I live in. Um, they have a very um, symbolic status. Uh, and they're also deeply, you know, they're highly politicized uh, uh, institutions, municipalities. So for instance, municipal elections will be very loud and very boisterous and very cheerful, not cheerful, but at least like very kind of uh, boisterous um, in Delhi, for instance. But it doesn't mean that the Delhi municipality actually has any power because the Delhi uh, region was in fact planned directly by the Indian parliament simply because the Indian parliament happened to be located in Delhi. Um, and, and it was a combination. So on paper, it was a combination of the, uh, the expats from the New York regional plan 
and some Indian planners that to put together the Delhi plan. Most people are really amazed to know that Delhi was planned by the same people who uh, were trying to plan New York because there is really very little similarity between the two, uh, two cities. But it was the same planning ideas, as I said. And then what happened is that the Indian parliament passed a series of acts that made those plans binding. So it had enormous executive power behind it, legislative and executive power behind it. Um, but that's, of course, not the norm. Normally, municipalities have to approve plans that are made by planners. So there is this very familiar um, tussle between expertise and specialization and people who are generalists and politicians. Having said that, uh, to this very critical question of who should really be in charge and who should be having the last say, this debate's been going on forever. Most plans do have at least some formal mechanism of what is called public consultation, um, including the Delhi master plan. But in most cases, it's a rather obscure exercise and the public gets intimidated by the amount of planning jargon and expertise that is thrown around in these meetings uh, and by this kind of maze of legislative and policy frameworks, urban policy frameworks. So it's not easy for the layperson to be involved in something that has become so obscure in a way. So if, my, if you asked me, I would say that um, cities shouldn't be planned at all. And that, that's, a, that's, a, that's an extreme opinion. Uh, I, I'm saying both. I'm saying that they are not in fact planned if you look at how they actually grow. And I'm saying that we should probably jettison this entire idea of planning itself. Because from my experience, it's been used for things other than what it talks, um, other than the stated ends. Um, that's another story. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I, um, I, uh, I don't want to be as uh, stereotypical, but I do feel that um, architects um, tend to focus um, I uh, think it's too much on the um, how it looks. For example, in the past two years, I've been doing a planning degree and it's affiliated in the School of Architecture, Planning and Landscapes. So uh, basically what I learned is that uh, as long as you get the drawings, uh, looks good. They don't care about, the, for example, how it works, will it work, and the economics behind a certain, for example, community plans. So um, do you think that um, um, economics or like uh, planning should uh, um, have a, have more say in the current planning practice than those than the architects. Certainly, economics will come in at some point, whether formally or informally. Um, I I just think that there are I think everything needs to come in. Like ultimately, these are spaces that human beings have to inhabit. So. Who are the humans that we are actually talking about? You know, at some point, planners began to develop really grand. And I've just put the Corbusier slide that I wasn't able to talk about on the screen just now, because Corbusier was trained as a, an architect. Uh, and he had these very grandiose schemes. In fact, the entire uh, fascination with skyscrapers in the 20th century that was part of the initial images and also part of some of the later images you know, it's not like skyscrapers are only popular in the north. I mean, they're wildly popular in the cities of the south and in places like Dubai, for instance, which has the Burj Khalifa um, and this, uh, this kind of obsession with height. Um, Corbusier was a designer of, was an architect of skyscrapers. He had no real training or expertise or background in designing cities, yet he designed one of our most important state capitals, Chandigarh, as is well known and was lauded for it. And it's a very strange city. Now, no, that's not the point. The point that just to come back to what you said is, so what should be the considerations? I think economics creeps in whether you want it or not. It's going to be there. It's going to come in at some point. Real estate is going to come in. There are going to be forces that are going to be difficult for planners to control. But ultimately, if you're designing spaces that human beings inhabit, then uh, you have to figure out, you have to find a way to figure out what they want. The gap between the planner and the person who finally lives in those spaces has become wider and wider and planning has become more and more ambitious in terms of, and national governments love this kind of jargon. They love thinking that the built environment is going to re-socialize the national citizen into the kind of model citizen that they want for the nation. 
So urban planning and city plans have got nicely sort of mixed up with grandiose national development schemes. It's, it's an incredible arrogance to think that the built environment is going to re-socialize the pre-modern um, you know, misfits of humanity, the, the misfits of all of pre-modernity and all of the misfits that it produces into the model urban uh, citizen and the model national citizen. So who, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dangerous ambition, according to me. Ultimately, the litmus test for planning any space should be who's going to live in it. And that's a question that's to do with culture, history, subjective understandings of what the urban experience is and so on, and necessarily very intangible. But I think planning has to find a solution. And, and planners like yourself who are thinking about this um, are the only hope really to, to, to bring this conversation back uh, into, into focus. Thank you very much. I think that's a really good point to end on. Uh, unfortunately, there was another question in the chat, um, but we're happy to pass that along uh, to Professor Kumar and she can maybe carry on the conversation offline. Um, but all it leaves me to do really is to say thank you so much to Professor Kumar for a really interesting talk. And it's definitely um, something that I've never really heard about before and it's definitely given me something to think about. So thank you very much and thank you everyone for joining. Hopefully you can still hear me even though I've got an unstable internet connection. Um, and I think that's us from, for today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, Ella and Lucy Cavendish. Um, I really enjoyed it. Thanks.